Monsieur Perron is from the Bloc Québécois for Agriculture and Agri-Food, and he is going to, after he speaks, he's going to take some questions, and we'll just mind our time again. So um, if you could move to the mic quickly after he speaks, identify yourself and ask your question, that would be great. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, will I have the translation for the questions or? <laughs> oh, yes. I'll yes. Get you a headset. Okay. Tum, 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 tum. Bonjour tout le monde. Hello everyone. <clears throat> if you'll allow, I'll speak French because I'm much more comfortable speaking French than English. Sometimes when I have no other choice, then I force myself to speak English, but it doesn't sound that great. Uh, so I, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today. And actually, it's more than a pleasure. It's actually an honor to be able to speak directly to all of you, the Canadian farmers. You represent a rather small percentage of the population overall. But in my view, you are the most important portion. Because if you were not there to feed our population, nothing else would happen. So that is absolutely fundamental, and it is something that we have to work on on a day-to-day -day basis. We have to speak up about the fundamental role that you all play. It really is a pleasure to be here with you. I was wondering what I could t talk to you about, and I decided to talk about my vision for the uh, agricultural field and what uh, I'm going to put forward in the next few months. My colleague, Alistair, who I really appreciate, has talked about some of the studies underway in committee currently. And I have three main uh, uh, parts for what I look at. Uh, first of all, there is uh, our food security. Alistair talked about it earlier. We're coming out of the pandemic. Alex, Alistair has talked about that. It has been difficult for everyone, and especially for all of you. And in any uh, hard situation, I always try to see the good side of things. We have to make the most of this situation, and I think that the agricultural world can benefit from the current momentum based on the fact that people are looking to buy local now more than ever. And people, even though the fact the price is a factor in their decision making, people are, are willing currently to pay a little bit more to have a product that comes from right here, that comes from their neighbor, that they know. They know that their that neighbor, if something goes wrong in a month, in a year, then that neighbor is still going to be there reliably to offer the goods. And the government has a fundamental role in encouraging that. I'm going to talk about supply management. You're not going to be surprised because as a critic, I am the critic for agriculture, agri-food, and supply management. I think you're all aware of the bill we put forward in the last uh, session to protect supply management in the next uh, upcoming international agreements. We intend to put that bill forward once again, and we will need your mobilization uh, to achieve our goal. We, all, we were almost there in the last session. It's important that we achieve it. There's also the notion of compensation. You have had a firm undertaking from Minister Bibo and as part of her mandate letter to continue to protect supply management and to compensate the commodities that were uh, impacted by the agreement with uh, the U.S. and Mexico. So that's fundamental and we are going to put pressure in this field. But beyond that, we have to have a global vision of the future. If we want to have food sovereignty, then we need to be able to process and transform our production more locally. Now, I'm not saying that we need to eliminate uh, those big plants, those big uh, uh, automized, uh, autom uh, internationally competitive plants, but I think that there should also be a network for regional small and medium-sized plants for food processing. And these plants could help if there was to be a mid-sap, whether it's a strike, it's COVID, or something else in one of those big, big plants. And every commodity pretty much has gone through this in the past two years. When there's a big plant that shuts down, it is very tough to get through. Uh, I'm thinking, for instance, of uh, poultry farmers, park 
pork producers. Uh, there are still some major issues there. And developing a whole parallel processing network with smaller plants, that would allow for less concentration as well. There is a degree of concentration in certain commodities, uh, in certain processing uh, sectors that really is starting to become unhealthy. We have to give more power to farmers, and that can be done only through the power of supply and demand. The government should set up a permanent program because we know that it is hard to uh, make money in this sector, so we need a permanent uh, program to help in having smaller regional processing plants. And there's also an issue with access to uh, foreign to workers. Foreign workers, you know that there are issues currently uh, that are not tough. They're terrible. They're worse than tough. And there are a lot. Of, as soon as there's pro pressure to help one sector, well, then the very next sector has a problem. And uh, a few months later, a few months down the line, they're also in trouble. This whole. T TFW system has to be reviewed. We already had proposals we came up with uh, in the summer 2020. Three-year visas, for instance, uh, uh, having uh, uh, also sorts of small steps that could be taken that would make things uh, simpler for you. And when I was talking about buying locally earlier, I meant, of course, uh, consumers who are looking to buy local, but the state also has to set the tone. The math that I took off a, se a second ago, I will use that as an example. It's made, it's uh, sown in Louisville by uh, Primo uh, business. And before Christmas, my uh, party had to rise in the House of Commons to get a motion from the MP so that we would stop wearing masks coming from China within the parliamentary building. I don't want to make a whole scandal out of this, but there's something completely abnormal about this situation. Why is it not an, a reflex? We have to set the tone, and we're doing it now, finally. But we had to fight to do that. So uh, there's a whole mentality, the whole f philosophy of uh, the lowest bidder. That's something that we need to review. Uh, we have to set the tone. I see that uh, time is fleeting, uh, so I'll start and go faster. Uh, so an emergency fund to help uh, farmers more directly. We talked earlier with Mr. McGregor about flooding in BC, and it always takes such a long time before the funds come in. It seems to me that we could uh, quicken the pace. And then uh, the young farmers, you are aware in the last uh, session we uh, had a conservative uh, bill come through which I had co-sponsored for young farmers to allow for uh, a fiscal exemption for them, a, a tax exemption. And I, it's important that we maintain that. And I know that the Liberal government intends to modify this bill. We'll, be very, we'll keep a cl very close eye on what they propose because we do not want to uh, limit what we can achieve through this uh, huge gain. And what I've been hearing, and maybe you can confirm that, is that certain accountants are saying currently, are telling their clients, well, wait a bit, because there's some, all sorts of uncertainty because the Liberals are probably going to change the law. And that's not acceptable. We want to put some pressure in this regard. Uh, risk management. Uh, I know that agri-stability, for instance, we did, we put on a lot of pressure for the, uh, the, mini for the 95 percent. The minister had put forward uh, 80. There are still some provinces where that is not moving forward, and I hope that it will move forward. What we feel is that if all the, the provinces don't want to get on board, we feel that the federal government should at least go forward with the governments, uh, with the provincial governments that are willing to go forward, and that's what we're proposing at this stage. And I want to talk about the code of conduct. Now, this is a very important issue, and I'm going to mention it because I think that what we have before us currently, what's underway, is in the opposition we have critics, but we also can be very constructive in our criticism. And in the blog, we, I think we've shown it since 2019. We've shown that we can put forward some very positive, const positive, constructive proposals. And 
the liberal pay plan is on the right track, and it was the right way to go about it because there's a matter of comp competency here. There, this is a provincial matter. So the committee with Mr. Lamontagne and Bibo has to come forward with recommendations in um, March or early April, and we shouldn't waste any time on this aspect. The government needs to move forward. The governments need to work to move forward with a code of conduct. And this code, which is currently being discussed by the various stakeholders, it must be very uh, useful. It must be a very, it must be mandatory for it to really work. And you can count on us to put pressure in this regard. And uh, still about food sovereignty as well, the protection of uh, fruits and vegetable growers, financial protections. This, this has been requested for years now because uh, uh, it's been refused, really, by the government so far. And I think that this is something that should move forward because it really doesn't cost the government anything. How often do you ask something from the government that won't cost it anything? It seems to me that they should uh, get on board immediately because there won't be a cost. But there's an issue here because of the power of banks in Canada. But I think that our farmers have every right to uh, be protected decently because they run huge financial risks to feed our population. <coughs> now, second, I've only spoken of one of my topics out of three. So the second topic is the environmental partnership. So uh, it, it's what I call the social pact. Uh, you talked about it earlier. We are have, uh, carrying out a study on supply chains currently and the difficulties that you can meet, that we all meet uh, within supply chains. And we're trying to figure out what we can do, what we uh, can uh, do to ensure that uh, that goes more smoothly. I think that it was urgent that we act. But I think that the study that we started in the last session has to be uh, put back on the rails on the impact on agriculture and the partnership that can be created between farmers and the government. And I think that the federal government has an important role to play because the federal government has means that other levels of government do not necessarily have. When I talked about competency earlier, well, the agriculture is a shared uh, responsibility. And it's important that we put the right resources there. And I feel, I'm trying to summarize things here, but my vision is that Everything that we do concretely to improve the environmental performance of a farm should be uh, should should find f some financial uh, contribution to help it out because it should be rewarded. Uh, a new type of agri-investment where, uh, when you look at the value, for instance, uh, just. Uh, Think uh, of uh, my first month as a, uh, an MP. I went to a far visit a farm in Saint Barthélemy, and uh, I could see uh, what they were doing uh, with um, having land by the side of, river of the rivers because uh, the government is asking for uh, the gov that to be to be done to protect the the environment. But there's a cost for businesses. I'm not saying that there should be uh, farming all the way to the the edge of the river, but why are we uh, put, having planting trees there and so on? Because it's a collective choice, a choice as a society. We want to protect the environment. And when we make that choice, we all collectively have to pay for that choice. It shouldn't be borne only by farmers. I know that you are willing sometimes to protect the environment and uh, forego some revenue because it's in your interest to protect the environment. Yes, but the state also has to do its share. The population as a whole has to do its share as well. Capable, et là, c'est là qu'est le défi. Être capable de développer un programme qui ne sera pas rigide. Developing a program that's not rigid, that doesn't require hiring four accountants to fill up uh, all the paperwork, it's too complicated. An efficient system that would allow you to measure the environmental impact of a measure and to uh, make a financial assessment, do it in your business and have the money to do it. Who is better placed to know what's the right time to invest? Who knows that more than 
the business person. Sometimes in politics we lose sight of that. People talk about farmers, but you, first of all, uh, business people. And there is no one here who wants to pollute more or who wants to be less efficient than the neighbor. You all want to innovate, but you need the means. So these monies could be available to you for the next innovation projects. We must uh, support our agriculture in a decent manner, and there are some in the room uh, that in the opposition it's easy to make promises about handing out money, that it's probably easier for me to say that than a minister. But you must look at the global situation. When you are compared to the United States producers, you are t twice uh, as likely not to be supported. So these are some disturbing facts. Uh, I don't have any problem saying we must invest. And in fact, if we don't invest in the environment, pollution, the impact of climate change, we've spoken about British Columbia. That's just one example amongst others. They were hard hit by extremes. First, the fire, and then uh, the floods the same year. And this is going to become more frequent. So what is more costly, supporting our producers daily or try to come up with fixes when things go bad, because things are going to go bad more and more often. I'm not sure how much time I have left. So I'm halfway through. That's good. I have five minutes left. So I spoke a lot about that, but that was my major issue to raise. It would allow companies to have access to a funding and to make better decisions, to come up with even more improvements. In, as far as the envir environment goes, there are certain independent decisions that have to be made. They have to be efficient without being uh, falling into laxity. Uh, I'm also suggesting that the government fund the non-organic uh, also. So that's as far as partnership. And when I talk about environmental partnership, I include the social pact. Let's start with the environment. But maybe I could even broaden out and talk about how to occupy rural territory. That role has to be recognized and compensated. The third aspect I would like to raise is the reciprocity of standards. I know it's a major challenge. I know it's more for, for, for the long term, but we must act. It's uh, very important to require from those who uh, import to, or that export to us, we should ask them minimally for the same standards we require of our producers, and that's not always true. We must also have better control of what comes in. I can talk about dairy production or chicken production. Those examples come to mind. We heard of this, uh, the DNA test that was done uh, for cold chickens that is not yet implemented. It was developed by the industry. It was paid, and uh, all the, uh, we have to do is uh, set it up. I, I don't understand why that's not yet implemented. I know things are sometimes slow, but we must move on certain issues. So in terms of uh, the reciprocity of standards, uh, a while ago, I was talking about the support for agriculture elsewhere compared to us here. A product that is fully subsidized, if it comes in at a lower price than ours, that's unacceptable. And as we talk about the environment, we must start to assess the environmental cost. Uh, I don't understand why a tomato from Mexico costs less than a tomato from Quebec. It, it's always more expensive. It, uh, so I, I don't understand. There are so many examples uh, I could bring up, but I would like to save some time for questions. Earlier I was talking about regional processing, the uh, uh, cattle sector. Nobody disagrees with animal welfare, but uh, the regulations have to be uh, implemented gradually. I know we've had some um, uh, measures along those lines. I hope we come up with some more permanent uh, regulations, but it doesn't make uh, any sense to get cattle to go all the way to Pennsylvania to be slaughtered. Uh, we must take into account the uh, regional processing. That's important. In addition, so I think I'm almost at 19 minutes. Just before I close, 
I would maybe raise some points in the mandate letter of uh, Madam Minister Bebo. The program for risk assessment, I mentioned that, the intergenerational transfer of uh, farms, the succession planning, supply management, I raised that, and uh, the agency for uh, the fight against uh, parasites. Uh, so I discussed this with Ms. Bibo, and I assured her of my full support, always in constructive opposition, so we can come up with concrete results in the field. Once again, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to address you, and specifically, I thank Madam Robinson, Mr. Caron, who is the president of LPA, but he has agricultural lands that are the closest to my riding. That means something. So I'm pleased to see you, Marcel. And also the dairy farmers, I can't name all of you, but I would like to greatly thank you for this opportunity, and uh, I'm pleased to answer your questions. I think you'll be speaking to me in French anyway. So good morning, Mr. Perro. Thank you for your expose. I'm from the Union of uh, Agricultural Producers. When you're talking about regionalizing uh, processing, there is nothing that says that consolidation and concentration of major businesses that, that this has come to an end. I think there are these economies of scale uh, that are masters in the field in terms of organizing these groups. So even the Competition Bureau is not really too much involved in that. So how do you see this? your ideas of regionalization being made concrete? I know I'm ambitious about a lot of things. I'm, I'm aware of all the issues you raise, but I do think it's important because the laws of the market require concentration, better performance, uh, speed, and there are shortages in labor. When I talk about increasing the number of uh, processing uh, plants, some people in the committee over the past few weeks said, well, to begin with, maybe you should find us labor for the sites that exist. So there are so many difficulties before us, but I think it's in this sector that the state has to play an important role. And when I talk of uh, financial support uh, to develop these uh, processing plants, there is an example in Bétier Masquinanger. I believe Mr. Caron knows about these. These are small slaughterhouses. I think there is uh, assistance for these startups that's important. We could make them permanent. In the past, we've seen these regional processing plants that had shut their doors because of these market laws, because they couldn't compete with the bigger plants that are further away. It was uh, cheaper for producers to move their uh, product further uh, to make higher prices. So th I think there's some systemic difficulties uh, that, are, that, are, that are structural. I think the right word is actually structural difficulties. I think the support from the government should be permanent. Could it be tax exemptions? Uh, I don't know. But if a processing plant in the regions re reduces the uh, greenhouse gas effects, that should be taken into account. We can't just um, account for what it costs every year. We must broaden it. Maybe we can work together on that uh, issue. Thank you. <laughs> OFA. One more. Okay. You can, you can start and maybe, uh, maybe I, can, uh, okay. I will understand. It's the same question as I asked uh, Mr. McGregor. Uh, McGregor. Yeah. So, Mr. Perron, would you consider supporting bills uh, C-234, you and your party, oh, yeah. uh, on, uh, on the carbon tax, on the cooling and heating and grain drying? Uh, oui. C'est une très bonne question. Yes, that's a very good question, especially for us. You know Quebec's situation had great, we had great difficulties with that build exemption, did not involve Quebec. And quite frankly, I consulted a lot of people in Quebec before supporting that bill. But we did support it in the end. And why did we do so? Because before coming up with these penalties, we have to provide alternatives. 
and I think Mr. Grolo would be pleased to, or maybe, I'm not sure if he's here or not, but it just reminds me of discussions that I had specifically with Mr. Grolo. You cannot impose these penalties if uh, uh, you don't provide alternatives. I often see in suburban, sub I have a suburban V8. If you tax my vehicle, I have access to a smaller electric vehicle. That's good because we want people to stop buying these heavier gas guzzling vehicles. But to buy green, there is no alternative whether it's less polluting, more efficient. We just have to develop it. There are things that exist. Uh, there are some processes that are very costly. We decided to support this bill, hoping that there would be an impact uh, in our region, because as you know, we are not involved with the same levels of taxation. We hope that within 10 years, if we can come up with uh, alternatives, that's good. The ultimate goal is to come up with petroleum and gas as energy. Right now, or to get away from those, rather, but I haven't really read the new form of the bill, but if it's similar to C-206, I will not have any problem with that. I had convinced my party to support that. No further questions? Okay, that's great. I think everything was clear. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, your invitation.